1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and it's in, and it's in page 1898 in your pew Bible. <clears throat> the word of life, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at in our hands, have touched this we proclaim concerning the word of life the light appeared we have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ we write this to make our joy complete. Thank you, Alex. Again, big welcome to our visitors. It's nice to have you guys this morning. <clears throat> I, I see some of you guys kind of looking at this going, well, this sounds kind of familiar. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it is exactly the same text that already used at the beginning of the sermon last week. And of course, I was tempted to just copy his sermon verbatim because it would be a lot easier for me. This is not intended as a recap, um, but as I was listening to Artie's sermon and thinking about, wow, it really is the beginning of the year. This is really a great text to begin with, and there is a lot written here. Um, I actually found uh, an angle that would help me kind of build on what Artie was talking about last week. And so don't worry, there is some variation here. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we are thankful that we can be here together this morning, Lord. Thankful for all those who are serving, Lord, everybody who gave their time and their energies and their experience, Lord, to plan lessons, to share the Word of God with us, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you'd help us to be thankful for that, Lord, thankful for this opportunity. Because we know that thankfulness, Lord, makes so much difference in our life and the way we live it. And we know it's pleasing to you, Lord. Please bless us now. Be with those who are sick, Lord. Be with those who are away. And please bless us now as we continue to just learn your word together in fellowship. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right. So again, as already pointed out, you know, this is the beginning of the year. It's a good time to kind of just stop, get our priorities straight, and sort of just plan for the coming year. And, and, uh, and so already focused on this. And if you remember kind of the thesis that he was talking about, his main point was that, you know, John builds his, you know, this book, this, uh, his, his letter here, on the fundamental principle that it's God's word that is the source of our understanding. And so already talked a, a lot about the need for us to get in that word and be regular about it. And uh, to that end, I'm really grateful, particularly with, uh, with uh, those who are participating and, and, and leading the, the different Bible studies. Um, certainly appreciate Jerry working on the, the blog, the Daily Week. And if you think about how much work that takes to every day, not just read, but be ready to, to, to provide those thoughts to kind of guide us. It's a, it's a tremendous amount of work, so we're really, really appreciative of that. So I got to thinking about John. He's an intriguing guy, as we pointed out. You know, as already pointed out, John the Apostle, by the time he's sitting on this island called Patmos, and I don't know if you've ever looked at a map where Patmos is. It's off the coast of Turkey, actually, but it's uh, part of the Greek Isles. As, uh, as already reminded us, you know, John is approaching the end of his life. Um, now, interestingly, when you start looking into John, you're reminded of all the references to him in the Gospels. It's really amazing. This guy's resume is pretty incredible. Um, he was originally known as one of the sons of thunder, if you remember. He had a brother named James. They together were the sons of Zebedee. Interestingly, we know that John was also originally a follower of John the Baptist. Um, John was actually following John the Baptist before he even really knew what God's plan of salvation was and who Jesus was and what role he played. So John is one of the one of the early guys. He's been around for a while at this point. And, uh, whoops. Um, we also learned that, you know, when you follow his account of the Gospels, man, he was there for a lot. He saw the transfiguration. He was one of only a couple of apostles who saw Jesus on the mountain take on his heavenly appearance. And we know what a profound impact that had on him. We know that he was with Jesus at the Last Supper. Not only that, he was actually lounging on Jesus's, on, on his chest. He was the disciple, they called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He was a witness to the crucifixion, as far as we know, the only disciple who actually was there watching this take place. And he was even charged by Jesus at the end for taking care of Mary. And of course, now here he is on the island of Patmos, and uh, he's actually experienced, and whether it was out of body or in the flesh, he's witnessed heaven. 
He's seen the apocalypse. He's seen the end of the world and the coming end of days. This is a guy with a tremendous amount of experience. It's quite a resume. If you think about it, you know, if he's sitting here on this island, you know, to me, I know that's, that's cause for retirement, if you ask me. I mean, this guy has been there, done that. It's, you know, he could easily be tempted to think, you know, I've got a pretty solid understanding of, of what it's all about. You know, and now I'm just going to kind of look forward to the end and, you know, wait for that, 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 you know, being able to go into heaven and be with God. But instead, we find John continues to write. And as we just read, his purpose continues to be to proclaim what he has seen and heard so that you, meaning us, will also have fellowship. And our fellowship was with Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We find that John, despite his experience, his priority continues to be uh, to continue a spiritual voyage. Despite his life with Jesus, his vision of the heavenly hosts, his exile in Patmos, his, he, he's pretty much reached the end of the rope. His spiritual voyage is not over. Meanwhile, we've got another example in Paul. Of course, we know Paul, too, had a very, very uh, eventful life, uh, filled with all sorts of experiences in his journey with, with, uh, with the Word. We know that Paul himself gives his own credentials, kind of his own background. He says, you know what? I've got a pretty solid background, he tells, uh, he, he tells uh, uh, us in uh, the book of Corinthians. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews before I even you know, knew who Jesus was. But he had a very strong spiritual background. And then he goes on to talk about his experiences. And boy, what a life he had. You know, uh, persecuted for the word of God. He said he was three times beaten with rods, pelted with stones, three times shipwrecked, spent a day and a night in the open sea. I don't know. Every time I read that, I, I think about what that would have looked like. So that's roughly 36 hours spent bobbing around in the middle of the Mediterranean with no real, I don't even know what he would have had. I don't think life jackets were in vogue at that time. He's hanging onto a barrel or something, but... I imagine that was a pretty long 36 hours. And of course, we know that by the end of his life, he finds himself uh, sitting in a Roman prison, condemned to death by the emperor. One way or another, you know, Paul could easily have seen his journey as pretty much over at this point. Um, and particularly with consideration of all he's been through, I'd say in many ways he's probably looking, well, he was looking forward to it. We know that. That could have been in the end of it for him as well. But instead, he spends his days writing. And he says, night and day, I constantly remember you, who us, and those around him, all those who would believe through him in his prayers. Recalling your tears, he says to Timothy in this case, I long to see you that you may be filled with joy. What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. We see that despite, in Paul's case, his credentials, his sacrifices, his imprisonment, and approaching death, we find that for him, the race wasn't over yet. <clears throat> he still had work to do. His knowledge, his relationship with Christ wasn't the end for him. In both the case of John and Paul, I think when we compare them, when we contrast them, we look at their experiences, we see that even at the end of, the li of their life, they did not see extensive experience, their credentials, their background, their understanding, or just personal challenges. I mean, John's sitting on an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. That's it. I mean, as far as he knows, he's writing this letter, Revelations. He doesn't even really know, you know, he has faith and will, but he doesn't know who it's going to reach. He doesn't, but he, he writes it instead. He writes it anyways. Paul, sitting in prison, awaiting death, really, writing his letters. Bottom line is they both see that it's not an excuse to spend time in fellowship, that's still their focus. Even if it's just by letter and courier, both of them understand the knowledge is only part of it. It's the fellowship that has to continue, and it does continue for them. They considered this regular, sustained Christian fellowship essential to their mission. It wasn't just about achieving personal relationship with Christ. It wasn't about learning about what his will was. Their priority continued to be to share that with others. And as I think about this, to me, the metaphor kind of ends up being, you know, I think a lot of us are tempted to see this idea of fellowship. It's kind of like a little bit like joining a gym. 
you know, we go down, we look around, we look at the list, we go, okay, let's see, we got the, you know, the abs of steel here, we got the power of yoga. Uh, yeah, that could work for me. I, I go down and check it out. And you go down to the gym, you peek in the classroom, and the first thing you see is me in there trying my power yoga. Oh, all right. You're thinking, you're looking at me going, man, I, maybe this is like the free introductory course or something. This does not, I don't think this is going to work for me. And so you go down to the next classroom, and you see Bill Walker in there doing the power yoga, and you're like, man, that guy is ripped. Oh, my God. He's like, like all the swords there in there. I, I'm not going in there. This isn't right for me either. And, you know, so you're kind of thinking, really, I don't know about this program. I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, I know, I'm doing pretty well at home. I'm just going mobile on or something. But I mean, I think what Paul and John are trying to say here is that really fellowship is not about creating this custom program, spiritual fitness program designed to get us in heaven. That's not, that's not what it's about at all. And so I started thinking about other metaphors that probably apply. And so in the, in the, in the, in the process, reading through this, now I uh, see here, I've lost my, let's see my, uh, where, let me make sure I'm citing this. I'd like you to read along with this. Yeah, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. I think this is a key, key section of text here because I think it really defines for us Christian fellowship and gives us something to hang on, some alternative to the, you know, the gym program metaphor. And so Paul here writing to the Ephesians, he said, So Christ gave himself, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works and services so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of him who is the head, that is, of Christ. So Paul here seems to be kind of anticipating these two different models, or one model, and then giving us an alternative. And what he's really saying here is a Christian fellowship, that fellowship that we are called to participate in, that Fellowship that John wanted to share even when he was on the island of Patmos, isolated. It's about using our experiences, our knowledge, our talents to build up the body until all of us have grown to maturity. All of us, everyone in this room, but that also goes to anyone else who would believe. And if you're keeping track, that has not happened yet. And many of you guys, for example, you know, my wife would say, yeah, definitely, you know, you're still working on it, Tom. I am, I am. And so, you know, even me, I'm still reaching, attaining maturity. The bottom line is we're all called to stick with this, and it's not really going to happen until after Christ has come. And so what that really says is Christian fellowship is something that we're called to participate in, and it's got to happen until everybody is ready. And that's quite a tall order. And I started thinking to myself, you know, what would be a better metaphor? And I got to thinking to myself about Paul and John. And now, I already pointed this out about Paul and John. I, I knew Paul had some experience on the sea. You know, obviously he'd spent a lot of time traveling by boat when he was on his, uh, on his, uh, on his missions. But John, too, was a fisherman. I think both of these guys definitely understood the metaphor that Paul was trying to work on here. And so what we imagine ourselves is a boat out on the open ocean during a storm. And Paul uses the metaphor here. He says it's really like being tossed around by the waves in a windstorm, blown here and there by every wind, every teaching, every cunning and craftiness of people, their deceitful scheming. That's really the world. The world is kind of determined to rattle us and keep us blowing around until we really don't know what the truth is anymore. We really don't know what right and wrong is. It's a matter of personal preference or I don't know what's good for you or maybe natural law. Bottom line is, I think a better metaphor for me is this idea of the life-saving service. And I don't know if you know anything about life-saving service here on Cape Cod, but basically the idea was that you know, Cape Cod is one of the most hazardous stretches of, of water on the eastern seaboard. Reason being is because, well, for a couple of reasons, really. One thing, it sticks way out in the middle of the ocean, you know, 60, you know, some 40 miles out. Um, it's right on the path between New York and, and coastal cities to the north. But one of the main reasons why it's so hazardous is really its shape. It's kind of got this north, you know, if you picture the arm like this, it's got this north-south stretch. 
And really the theory is this, is that on a, during a nor'easter, if you know anything about that, it's prevailing winds from the northeast, sometimes reaching hurricane speeds. The bottom line is, if you find yourself either coming from the south toward Chatham, and you're caught in the northeaster, if you can see the shore, you're going to end up piling on the rocks, or at least on the sand. The reason being is because that stretch of land from, from Chatham all the way up to Provincetown is too long. By the time you try to get around the, the north end, the, the wind is going to blow you onto the shore. Same thing happening from the north. If you can see the shore during a northeaster coming from Provincetown, whether you realize it or not, you're going to end up washed up on the beach. And of course, too, you know, it's not the beach, really. It's the unseen sandbars that lie about two miles off the shore. That's what tends to get the boats trying to make it through there. And so for hundreds of years, this was a problem. Eventually, the people of Cape Cod took it on themselves and said, we can't just stand by and watch this. We've seen it happen too many times. And so a group of volunteers got together and they came up with a system. And what it looked like was every single day and night, nonstop day and night, volunteers would walk up the beach. And they'd walk three miles in one direction and three miles back. And what they were looking for, particularly during storms, that northeaster was any sign of a ship. Because they knew, particularly in bad weather, you could see the ship, regardless of where it is, it's going to pile on the rocks, up on the sand. And so they would walk that stretch of beach day and night during rain, shine, storms, whatever. And, and what they were literally looking for were ships in distress. And interestingly, they had a motto, and I don't know if you know the motto, but their motto was, you must go out. And the reason that's pointed to me is because it shows that, you know, if you're walking two miles up the beach in a snowstorm, a blizzard, and you see a ship, and you know from experience that ship is going to end up on the shore one way or the other, you've then got to run two miles back to the life-saving station to get the other guys, get that surf boat, and get it ready to go. And so in my own mind, I can imagine what I would be saying to myself. Ah, this does not seem like a good idea. Wind's really strong. I'm looking, I'm seeing nine foot waves out there. I know that ship's gonna end up on the, on the, on the bar and I know it's gonna get beaten to pieces, but I, I don't think we can do it. I don't think, I don't think. And so that motto, you must go out. The idea was that that was the final word. You must go out, you must go out. Lifesavers on Cape Cod knew that it wasn't about you being secure on the beach. You being secure and being able to go back to your home was about the guys out there in the water that were not secure. And so, for me, whoop, sorry. it says that no matter where we find ourselves as Christians, regardless of our experience, regardless of our challenges, we understand Christmas Christian fellowship, what it means is making connections. And if you want to use the metaphor that Paul was thinking of, it's making connections between the safety of the beach and those being tossed away around by the waves at sea during a storm. And so... This is where we find John saying, for him, his priority says, we want to tell you, the life appeared, we've seen it, we testified, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Remember, he's writing, after a full life, he spent time with Jesus. He saw the transfiguration. He saw the crucifixion. He saw the resurrection. This guy's pretty, probably fairly set in his own knowledge, but his purpose remains, we want to proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you might have fellowship with us. John understood that fellowship means connecting with others on a regular basis, rain, shine, storms, clear weather, so that all can make it to solid ground. And my point that I want to make here is that I often hear this, you know, I hear this discussion, and I've thought about it myself too, you know, when you think about programs that we offer here at Cape Cod Church of Christ, you know, that tendency kind of remains that we sort of think about our own goals. We're thinking, well, where am I in my walk? What do I need to keep pushing along, keep moving along, keep moving forward? And so we tend to use that as our sort of our guide to picking and choosing those fitness programs. But I think what Sean and Paul are trying to say here is that it's all fair game. Because no matter where you, whatever programs you plug into, trust me, there are going to be folks there who have more experience than you, who can share their understandings and help you as you get tossed by the storms of life. And there's always going to be somebody there who needs you to share your experiences. And so... By way of closing, I just thought it'd be a good time of year, beginning just to remind ourselves of what programs are being offered so that we can all say, hey, where do I belong? Where can I go?
to build in my own personal understanding and be sure to you know be ready to throw the lifeline to somebody who needs it. And so Tuesday Bible study, 7.30 p.m. the Schaefer Zone, God's, God's Love Story. Um, that's what I've been trying to participate with regularity. I gotta say it's a great group of people there. Um, getting together, everybody in various phases of their walk, sharing, laughing, loving together, reading the word. There's Thursday Bible study, 7 p.m. at the building, Life of Christ. There's also Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Every 10 a.m. on Sunday, we have Bible study. We have, we, we're, we're now we're rethinking our program and trying to make sure there's something for everybody, but we've got the kind of what we call the toddler to five years old. That group, Kim Frieda's working with them. They're six to eight years old, roughly in there, and that's Effie and Carol. There's a new group called the 9 to 11s. It's the tweens group. And there's a group of parents who are sort of you know, running that show. It's for, for 9, 11 years old. And then there's 12 to 17 year olds. It's kind of the teens class. That's for me. And then there's the adult Bible study. The bottom line is there are so many opportunities in this church, in this church community for fellowship. And I personally think that, you know, it's like, you know, obviously worship service is important. We're called to gather around the table, participate in the Lord's Supper, sing songs of praise. But I guess what I want to just, you know, at this beginning of the year now is just to point out that that's only part of what we're called to do. John and Paul both realized that Christian fellowship means we're there. We're plugging in. We're ready to look for those folks who need our experience, who want to study the word together with us. And so um, we're all in the storm of life together. And few, if any, are going to make it to shore alone. I remember when I first started my Christian walk, and I was actually living in Turkey at the time, and I was corresponding back and forth with, uh, with uh, an, an elder at a church. I don't even know where it was anymore, but it was Church of Christ uh, elder. And I, I pointed out, you know, there's not really a lot of opportunity for fellowship here. I don't even know exactly where I would go. And he said, well, you know, just bear in mind, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. However... It's a pretty good idea if you can. The idea being is fellowship is really what we all need. It's more about spending time in fellowship and that encouragement. And so, um, and so the bottom line is that informed my choices. Uh, bottom line is few of us can make it to shore to get to alone. And that's why we're here is to encourage each other. And so that to me is kind of a good focus as you consider the programs that we have available, the one that's right for you and one that's right for your kids. Um, Closing out, I would like to say, though, that if, if, if you're not a Christian today, the basically, sorry, this metaphor is for you. The idea that you are on a ship at sea, and the bottom line is that the shoreline is approaching. And just like in the metaphor with the ship at sea, the fact that you can see the shoreline, the fact that you can see it, is not necessarily a good thing. If you're not a Christian, you are not yet in a position where you can even reach the solid ground. And so you're invited this morning, if you, if, if you, if you perceive the word, if you, you know, our first step is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the second thing is to repent for those sins, those mistakes that have separated us from him. To be baptized, which is to immerse yourself in, in baptism, to rise again, to be a new creation. And to spend the rest of your life confessing that belief in, in Jesus, that's, that's the secret to finding your way safely to the shore. And if you are a, a Christian who has found yourselves being tossed by the storms of life and, and you need someone to come up here and pray with you, this is your time to do it. And we invite you now as we all stand to sing. <laughs>